Hi, this is Tori Wheel with the Oracle Technology Network. We're here live at the floor of DevNexus talking to members of the Java community. And I have the distinct honor of talking to Mr. Ed Burns. Hey, Ed, how are you doing? Very good, happy to be here. Thank you, I'm glad you're here. Um, so, you are a co-spec lead on JSF. Yes, I am. Okay, great. So, I want to know, I hear rumors that uh, HTTP 2.0 is going to be complete this year, right? That's right. Okay, so that means that there's a need of new JSF, new servlet, well, all sorts yes, of things. Exactly. So you okay. meant, I mentioned co-spec lead, right? Well, I'm okay. a co-spec lead in two different ways. Okay. Um, I'm working on HTTP uh, 2.0 with the servlet specification, and my colleague there is uh, Xinghuai Chan, who has been doing the servlet spec for a lot longer than I have. So I am co-spec lead with him on servlet, and uh, we're also sharing the responsibilities on JSF where I am co-spec lead with Manfred Rehm, uh, and he and I are continuing to evolve JSF with uh, version 2.3 of that specification. Okay, so JSF has been out a long time, mm -hmm. right? So this is a pretty mature technology that a lot of people are dependent on. So how can you move forward, put new features, do new cool stuff, and not break backwards compatibility? That's an important thing, and that's something that uh, Java, and JSF have kind of taken some lumps about over the years. Right. But I think if we, you know, it's now emerging that people are realizing, you know what, the backwards compatibility story that Java has been delivering and JSF also delivers because it's a part of Java EE um, is really important. Uh, this case was really uh, illustrated quite nicely when um, there was some backlash in the Angular community Angular JS, which was a, a JavaScript framework that was is widely seen as a, you know uh, it's another view technology framework that fits well for de delivering web-based applications and in that sense competes with JSF. Uh, in lots of other senses, it doesn't compete with JSF. But my point there is, when they switched from Angular one to Angular two, they did so in a non-backwards compatible way. And there is a school of thought that says, ah, you're going to rewrite your entire UI every two years anyway just get used to it and accept that's how it is. Mm, mm -hmm. Now that school of thought isn't as popular in, in the enterprise world <laughs> where Oracle is uh, a, a big player and uh, it's a very important market for us. It is our main bread and butter is to do enterprise software. So um, the backlash and debate about uh, the virtues of backward compatibility have been um, illustrated recently with that, with that right, Angular right. thing. Now, um, but the challenge, though, is how do we do new and innovative things without breaking back compatibility? So a lot of the stuff we're doing in JSF 2.3, um, we're really basing it on to uh, the, f the version that's specified in the faces config that XML file. So many of the features that might have a disruptive impact, um, we're putting them behind this, what we call the 2.3 switch. And uh, if oh, your faces config, okay you know, it doesn't have 2.3 or it's, it's older, you know, it's going to be everything continuing to work as it always has. Now, if you decide to do the upgrade and move to 2.3, then certain things um, are changing, but you're also going to be getting a lot more new features. One feature we're doing, and this is the theme for Java EE 8 at, at large, is better cohesiveness between all of the different specifications. Oh, yay. Right? People will like that. Right. <laughs> so um, we're going to be leveraging CDI even more than we did in JSF 2.2. Um, for example, the managed bean annotations um, are going to be, uh, if you have the 2.3 switch enabled, they're going to be CDI based. Whereas if you're, they're not, if you don't have the 2.3 ah, switch okay. set, they'll be the old-fashioned regular JSF managed beans. So it's a little bit like having your uh, software in classic mode or the new mode, Kind of right? like that, oh, yeah, okay. kind of like that. But, um, you know, nothing that we're doing in 2.3 is going to be so radical that, you know, stuff just stops working. No, that's, that's a bridge too far that, we, you know, we won't take. But um, it is a way of letting us uh, test out things in a way that people have to opt in. Ah, okay. Know. Great, that's a pretty good solution to try and, and it's certainly to balance these competing needs. It's right? not a novel or a new solution, solution, but it's just the one that's an established solution mm -hmm. to use that approach. Right. So right. we're yep. just you know, not inventing a new idea here, we're just using a pattern that's already well established. 
Okay, so tell me how you're working in relation with what's going on with MVC and the upgrades there and Very the changes. Very good question. Yes. Okay. So that's one of the factors that it is going to be in relation to the 2.3 uh, switch. Uh, the MVC framework is a new part of Java EE8, and uh, it's one of only two 1.0 specifications that are going to be in EE8. Okay. The other one being uh, the security JSR, and. Um, the, the deal with MVC was uh, we felt that it was the, the community feedback was telling us this is a piece of how people are building apps that Java EE doesn't really address. And so it was, in that sense, a hole that we needed to fill in the platform. So um, it fits for those kinds of markets, for those kind of applications where they want to have a high degree of control over the request processing lifecycle. What happens mm. when... Um, you know, how does the action get invoked? You know, how does the uh, lifecycle fit with your particular application? With JSF, it takes dependency injection to an inversion of control to a very high degree because, you know, it's like you define the different objects and how they plug into the lifecycle, and then JSF will call them at the right point in time to do the right ah, thing. Ah, okay. How as that's, that's the inversion of control that JSF offers. But MVC turns that upside down, and it's like, okay, it's the application's responsibility to do all of these things. And what the framework does is actually a lot less, a lot leaner. And so, um, really, it's a piece that was designed to be in JAXRS initially. Uh, in fact, Jersey had a great uh, prototype implementation of this whole concept and has had that implementation for a long time. So they're standardizing those ideas in the MVC specification. Now, how that fits in with JSF is, JSF is a view technology, and it is going to be one of the two standard view technologies that this new MVC specification will support, the other one being JSP. Um, but a key piece of the MVC specification is the allowing of plugging new layers or new kinds of view technologies and new templating languages, for example. Oh. Mustache or FreeMarker are two ones that people often talk about. Okay. Uh, so what we're doing in JSF 2.3 is whatever changes we need to make to the specification so that it fits well with what they're doing in MVC. Excellent. So that's a good overview of JSF. Tell me a little bit about what's going on with servlet okay. technology. On the servlet side. So servlet is also a very well-established technology uh, with even higher requirements for backward compatibility because um, you know if you make some changes to how the in async API is invoked for example uh, when does on all data read get called you know if that's something that we change the semantics of even slightly uh, that could have some undesirable side effects so uh, one aspect of the work we're doing in the next servlet specification is to allow the container vendors, you know, we have people from Red Hat, we have uh, Greg Wilkins from uh, Jetty, all of the container vendors are represented on the expert group. They have, you know, might have some cross-vendor differences in behavior. We're going to try to iron those out and, and define, you know, if there is ambiguity in the spec, how it really should be and, and put that in there. But it will be more like specifying how things are rather than changing them to be a different way. So that's one piece. Another big piece, of course, is allowing HTTP2 to be fully supported in the Java EE uh, environment. And uh, it could be as simple as just, you know, the specification says the implementation must support HTTP2, or the more likely case is that we have some select features from the HTTP2 specification that we actually expose as a part of the servlet programming model. Wow. And you know the most popular one there would be server push. Oh, okay. Uh, and and what does that allow you to do? And server push fits in with uh, the overall goal of HTTP2 specification, which is make the user experience of the web faster. The H2 spec was uh, and is uh, driven largely by uh, Google and the browser vendors, and they're all wanting to make sure that user perceived page load times are as fast as possible. So right. it's actually perception is a key part of this. So one of the optimizations which came over from uh, their adoption of the speedy technology from Google is this concept of server push, which is if the server knows in advance what follow-on resources you're going to need along with that page, 
it can give them to you uh, even before the browser asks for them. So it's like if you're going to a fast food chain and you want to buy uh, a number three meal, right. you know, you're going to get the fries, the burger, and the Coke all delivered to you at the same time. Ah, it's okay. not like you get one you know, you get one piece of it, and then you read that piece and say, oh, I, I need the rest of the items on the menu as well. You know, server push lets you give it, lets the server all at once. give all of them at once. Right? Excellent. Okay. I'm going to ask you a non-technology related question, but I'm, I really, after all the discussion about all the great work you're doing with members of the community, with other companies and things like that, how much time do you get to code anymore, and what percentage of your time are you spending working these issues? Well, it's, uh, I, it's a good problem to have uh, right. in, this, in this place where I'm at because um, Oracle has um, a large and successful product portfolio uh, that depends on JSF. Uh, we have the Fusion middleware stack, we have Fusion apps, and um, those need to be supported. So a fair amount of the time is uh, making sure that those run well and those are, um, you know, continue to function correctly as we continue to evolve our larger product portfolio. So. Uh, to quantify it in terms of percentage, I like to scope it out over the course of a year. Okay. And if I spend, you know, half of my time coding, then I think I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, I'm impressed. You know, so yeah, yeah, that's if, great. If I can pull that off, that's a good, a good, Excellent. good mix. Excellent. So kids, remember that at home, that it's, you know, the soft skills too is oh an yes. important part of taking technology forward. And here's a great example. Thank well, you very, very much kind. for Thank dropping you, by. And I'm sure you can go out to java.net to get more information well, about yes, what's uh, going on. We, we, yes, um, go to basically the, the main page for all of the EE8 stuff will just be the glassfish.org. Okay, That's go to glassfish.org and you can get more information about EE8, which will have this new technology in it, yep. right? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming by. Good to see you. Always, Always a pleasure. Good. All right, thank you. This is Tori Wheel with the Oracle Technology Network.